Well, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic's call for higher rates and more hikes, adding fuel to the bearish bet fire. But our next guest says not to be tempted to bet against the markets as a whole, but to be selective about sectors. Joining us now is Ben Emmons, Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income and Macro at New Edge Wealth. Good to have you back on the show, Ben. We know the mantra, don't fight the Fed, but you're saying don't fade the Bostic. Break down that argument for us. Yes, indeed. Don't don't do that because you know there's a lot of people out there that make the bearish bets purely on the Fed, and meaning the Fed may have to continue a bit further with rate rate rises, and then it should just simply bring valuations all the way down again. Now that interest rates have an impact on valuations is clear that we've experienced it over the past year. The, the stock market had to digest a different Fed policy than we were used to over the last decade. But we're in an environment now where it looks like the economy is having, again, resilience. The jobs number was obviously explosive and really above anybody's expectation, including the Fed. So it does underscore that rising rates may be indeed needed, as, as Bostic was saying. But if you have a strong economy, it doesn't necessarily mean then that the stock market should correct downwards. It should actually be up. And I think that continues to be the theme this year because a strong jobs market signals no recession. So why should stocks then be down? So I think for that reason, you don't fade Bostic, as I said. You don't go you know, short the stock market because the Fed is raising rates. Rather, you actually stay somewhat more constructive but selective that the market is in a good spirit here because of the economy being resilient. And fade, just in case people aren't sure, means to take a contrarian view. Um, but we know that Bostic told uh, Bloomberg, at least, that he does expect a higher rate than projected. It could be an extra 25 basis point hike. It could be a pause and then a hike. He, they even said not taking really a 50 basis point hike off the table. But he does support the downshift that the Fed is on. What is Powell going to have to say today to really perhaps get things back on track? Because once you mes mentioned disinflation more than a dozen times in a press conference, markets hold on to these things and that's for sure and I, I really agree with you on that is that you know the moment he mentioned that word disinflation you know it was it, it was coming from Powell himself as an official confirmation that the Fed now really believes that the economy is experiencing disinflation more consistently from here so that message is in the market's mind uh, and that is connected with that. Be, there's another view in the market that thinks, OK, if you are in disinflation, you, you do not have to hike that much anymore. If anything, you may be able to cut rates. Now, that, too, has changed since the jobs number. And I think that, too, is what Bostic was alluding to, is that, no, we cannot really cut rates. But we are in an economy where if we have strong job growth, we may have to raise rates several more times to then get to this outcome that we do end up with inflation being more moderate than what we've seen last year. So Powell has to thread that needle today in, in this conversation with David Rubenstein. I do think that he will stick to that point that he says, yes, the process has started, but that that job is not done. And he does try to echo what really the messenger Bostic is saying currently, you know, you cannot really cut rates. You have to continue to raise rates several more times to get to a rate that does lead you to a more consistent disinflation from here. I think that's what he may emphasize today. And certainly that jobs number, uh, even though it was a strong jobs number, some nuances in there, not just seasonality, but also some population changes that the BLS also factors in specifically to January reports. But I know that that is the main factor, at least that was from markets. But what are some of the, the other factors you think that the markets are not pricing in that might keep the Fed in more restrictive territory? Well, if you take, for example, uh, overnight, you had the Australian Central Bank coming up with a really interesting statement about their situation. You know, it's it's a country that's closely linked to China. And as we're all watching the China reopening impacting the, the globe, Australia is one country where the effects show up first. And the Australian Central Bank decides to hike rates as expected, but signal they may do more rate rises because they see global factors, as in China factor, affecting their domestic inflation. Now, this will be something that will be on Powell's mind too, because it's not just a really unique situation here in the US, given certain maybe categories of, of goods that are driving up our inflation rate. It's really what's happening globally. If China reopens fully, we all know that's going to impact demand for commodities, it's going to impact demand for energy. So it does lead you to also calculation in, I think, Powell's mind that 
whatever comes out of the China reopening, it does lead to pressure on prices. So that too, you therefore cannot relent at this moment in, in your federal, uh, in, in your monetary policy, you know, meaning too quickly going from tightening to easing. So I think that that's something that the markets is still trying to grapple with. You know, there's a lot of expectation about China boosting maybe global growth, but it's unclear what inflation will do from here. I think that Powell takes the cautious side on that front and says, you know, we do keep in mind that that, that could drive up inflation again and therefore stay vigilant on interest rates. And it's interesting because as Jared was mentioning, some of the sentiment that's actually been doing well this year, things like some of the tech stocks, some of the ones that need to turn a profit, meme stocks, cloud and things like that. You're actually saying that if you're going to fade anything, it should be those. And you included ARK in that as well. Break that thought process down for us. Yeah, I think it was a good a good uh, uh, diagram that, that your colleague showed. You know, you saw in the upper left hand corner, you know, the real speculative, quote unquote, speculative area of the market. And obviously that had done really, really poorly last year. And as people get excited about, hey, the economy may not be in a recession and or other thoughts about the Fed may move to easing, whatever their reasoning is, the money came off the sidelines and found its way into the segments that you highlight in that upper left left hand corner, which meme stocks, Bitcoin and, and, and ARK Innovation. Now these could be good investments long term, but we also have to keep in mind that those are really liquidity driven type movements that we're seeing there, as in money that was parked on the sidelines comes into these in these sectors first. And I think to an extent, as the money also went into China ETFs, it spilled over into that speculative sector there too. So I say, if you think about fading this rally, which seems you know a narrative out there, I say don't mm-hmm. fade it because of you know the broader rally, given that the economy is not in recession. But if you do want to take some you know fading, so to speak, then you may look at that speculative area. I mean, if you're up 30, 40 percent already to start a year, right. some of that, that's quite high returns, I think, to start with. Indeed, we see investors really still trying to search for some sort of direction and at least try and get off the sidelines. But with some caution here, Ben Edmonds, the Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income and Macro at New Edgewell. Thank you for joining me.